And I'm going to be talking about the coming war with Amalek. I believe the spring of this next year through the spring of 2025, we're prophetically going to see the Isaiah 17 war take place and the Psalm 83 war take place. Genesis 45 verse 1. It all goes back to Joseph. There stood no man with Joseph while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. Did you know that happened on Yom Kippur? And I can prove it. First off, let me say this. Yom Kippur was also known as the only day the high priest would speak to God face to face. Only once a year could he go into the Holy of Holies. There's the ark. God's there and he would speak to God face to face. Look at Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 33 through 35. As I live, says the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with fury poured out, I will rule over you, and I will bring you out from the people. I will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered with a mighty hand, with a stretched out arm, and with fury poured out. And what am I going to do? I'm going to bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there I will plead with you face to face. This event will happen on Yom Kippur. He's going to speak to them. Yom Kippur is the very day the veil will be moved from Israel's eyes and they'll know Yeshua is their Messiah. That is the event that Yom Kippur prophetically speaks of. Just like with Joseph, it was on that day the veil was removed and he saw he was Joseph. That happened on Yom Kippur. And that's the day Israel's going to recognize Yeshua as their Messiah on that day. Look at this, Genesis 45, verse 6. Joseph is speaking to his brothers, saying, go get dad and bring him back here. He says, for these two years has the famine been in the land, and yet there are how many more years? Because two plus five is seven. Okay, now follow this. Let me see. So many good things. Okay, first, I want to go here. Then we're going to come back. Isaiah 25, verse 7 and 8. God is going to destroy in this mountain the face of the covering that is cast over who? All people. The veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away all tears from all, off all faces, and the rebuke of his people is going to take away from off all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. There's a veil that is over the Jewish people, but there's also a veil over all the nations, and the veil being removed speaks of Yom Kippur. Most of the church today, due to replacement theology, has a veil over their face concerning the eternal plan that God still has for the Jewish people. The veil consists of two parts. The inability to recognize God's purpose for the Jews. They think God is done with Israel. It's done with the Jews. It's all about us. The other one is an inability inability to understand the church's role 
for the removing of the veil. God will remove the veil from both groups. The Christians will realize Jesus was Jewish. And the Jews will realize Jesus was Jewish. But he's waiting for something significant to happen first. Let's look at Zechariah 12.10. God says, I'm going to pour upon the house of David, the tribe of Judah, and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and be in bitterness as one that is bitterness for his firstborn as God is in bitterness because of the death of his firstborn. This is where John 19, 37, again, the scripture says they will look on him whom they have pierced. This is referring back to Zechariah. Now look at Revelation 19, verse 2 through 13. Or verse 2 and then verse 13 through 15. It says, for true and righteous are his judgments. For he's judged the great whore which corrupted the earth with her fornication. He's avenged the blood of his servants. Remember the big cry was, when are you going to avenge? And here it says, he's avenged the blood of his servants. He was clothed with a vesture dip in blood. His name is called the word of God. The armies which are in heaven follow him on white horses clothed in fine linen. All right. White and clean, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he'll smite those nations, he'll rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads what? The winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Okay, where it says true and righteous are his judgments and revelation, do you know what they're quoting? The Song of Moses. Look here, Deuteronomy 32 verse 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. All his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Okay, on Yom Kippur, what happens? Everyone wears what color? White. All right. It is, think of the wedding. Typically, the bride comes in what? White. And when they come on the horses, what color are the horses and their garments? Because it's a Yom Kippur event. This event will literally happen some year on Yom Kippur. That is why. And here they are singing the song of Moses, which is a Torah portion coming to a place near you. It's called Hazinu, which says, give ear, O you heavens and earth. And what do we hear in Revelation to all the churches? He who has an ear to hear, let them hear. And what it is, it's the song of Moses. And if you don't know the song of Moses, you won't know what to be listening to. Second Corinthians 3, 13 through 16 says, don't, but not as in Moses' time, he even had to put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end that which is abolished, but their minds or their hearts were blinded. Till this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Tanakh, which veil is done away with in Messiah. But even to this day, when Moses is read, there's a veil upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it will turn to the Lord, the veil will be taken away, which is what happens on Yom Kippur. It'll happen that day. Israel has yet to enter into their prophetic holy calling. Now, Revelation 1, 7, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him. And they who pierced him, all the kiddos of the earth will well because of him, even so, amen. So again, this is going to be happening on Yom Kippur. Now, let's go back to Joseph. Genesis 41, verse 1. Joseph had given the dream of the butler and the baker. One of them died, and one of them got to go serve Pharaoh, Okay. And then it says, it came to pass at the end of two full years, Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. You know what it means when it says two full years? It means from Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah. So Pharaoh is having his dream on Rosh Hashanah, which means Joseph interpreted the dreams at Rosh Hashanah. 
or the Feast of Trumpets. Two full years, Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah go by. All right. And then what happens later? We have the seven years of plenty. And then, which is Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah. Seven, it's a Shemitah cycle. And then the next Shemitah cycle, which is of the famine, which starts on Yom Kippur. His brothers realize he's the Messiah. And it says these two years has the famine been in the land. And yet there are still five years in which there will be neither earring nor harvest. Okay. That's Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah. The two years go by. And then, of course, 10 days later is Yom Kippur. He puts them in hold. And then what happens? The veil is removed when Judah repents and they realize he's the Messiah on Yom Kippur. All of this is tied right back to the scriptures. And then it says in Genesis 42, 8, prior to that, Joseph knew his brethren, but they didn't know him. All right? And that's what it says in John 1. He came unto his own, but his own received him not because they didn't recognize him. Okay, so what is the main reason that Joseph's brothers didn't recognize him? Look at the picture. Why did Joseph's brothers not recognize him? He looked Egyptian. He spoke Egyptian. He had an interpreter. He looked, he smelled, was dressed. Well, guess what? Here is how the church has been presenting Jesus for the last 2,000 years. And they wonder why they can't recognize him. The church is responsible to remove that veil and let them know Yeshua loves Torah. It's not done away with. Yeshua keeps the feast. They're not done away with. Yeshua follows Torah. Yeshua keeps the Sabbath. The church always sends these missionaries to Israel and they do much more harm than good because that's who they're presenting. That's the problem. Okay, this is what replacement theology does. This is why it has to be abandoned. Yeshua is seen as some white blonde European far from his own roots. How is offering a pagan Jesus good news to the Jew? Now, I'm going to jump ahead to next week. Next week is Sukkot. Okay? Rosh Hashanah is the wedding. Sukkot is the wedding supper. Okay? They say uh, uh, the Jewish wedding typically, typically is seven days long. And if you remember, in Ezekiel, a day for a year. And so you have seven years for the wedding. And at the end is the wedding supper. So watch. Look at Luke. This is going to be hard for some Christians. But Luke 12, verse 35 through 37. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And be like men who wait for the Lord when he returns from the wedding. What? There's going to be believers who don't make it to the wedding. They get to make it to the wedding supper. They get to make the wedding supper. That's seven years later or seven days later. But they don't get to go to the wedding. It says, so that when he comes and he knocks, they may open it to him when? Immediately. He came and knocked the first time for the wedding, but no one responded like in the Song of Songs. And so they went out and looked, and he was gone. It says, blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he comes, finds watching. Verily I say to you, he shall then gird himself, make them to sit down to food, and he will come forth and serve them. At the wedding supper, the Messiah will be serving all of us that make it to the wedding supper. Now look at Matthew 8, 11, and 12. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west, and they're going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the children of the kingdom is going to be cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's referring to the tribulation. There are children of the kingdom of God that are going to go through the tribulation and get to make the wedding supper, but they don't make the wedding. This comes from Zephaniah. Look at Zephaniah 1, 7 and 8. 
Hold your peace at the presence of the Lord your God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He's bid his guests, and it'll come to pass in that day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish who? The princes, the king's children, all those who are clothed with strange apparel. The strange apparel refers to our own righteousness. We have our own tux on, our own three-piece suit on. We're coming in our own works, our own righteousness, not in the garment that the king gave you. We're trying to come in our own righteousness. Look at Zephaniah 1.14, a few verses after that. The great day of the Lord of God is near. It's near. It hastes greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty men will cry bitterly. So Zephaniah 1 speaks of that day. Now, here's look at this, Matthew 22, 1 through 5. In 8 through 11, Jesus answered and spoke to them again by a parable, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a king, which made a marriage for his son. Hmm, that sounds like the father who's making a marriage for his son, a wedding. And he sends forth his servants to call them that were bidden. Again, that's the personal invitation I was talking about at the beginning of the service. Everyone is given a personal invitation. But they wouldn't come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, tell them which are bidden. That's the believers. Behold, I've prepared my dinner. My ox and my fatlings are killed. Everything's ready. Come to the marriage. But they made light of it and went their way. One to his farm, to his merchandise. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready. But they which were bidden were not worthy. So go into the highways as many as you find. Bid to the marriage. So those servants went to the highways, gathered together all, as many as they found, both what? bad and good. We're not to judge. We're just to catch the fish and bring it in and let him separate them. The problem with so many Christians in churches, they try to separate the people. We're to just bring them all in. Who cares? And the wedding was furnished with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man who had on strange clothing. He didn't have on the wedding garment that the king provided. He came in his own fine clothes. Wedding garment. Look at Luke 14, 16 through 24. He said, a certain man made a great supper and bid many. He sent his servant at supper time to tell them which were bidden to come. Everything's ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first one said, I bought a piece of ground. I have to go check it out. I pray. Let me be excused. Another said, I bought five Oxen, I got to prove them. Please, let me be excused. And others said, I married a wife and I can't come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. And then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets, the lanes of the city, and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as you have commanded, and yet there's still room. And the Lord said to his servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, compel them to come in, that my house may be full. I tell you, none of those men which are bidden will taste of my supper. There's going to be a separation. Some people won't even make it to the wedding supper. Now, in Ezekiel 4 6, when they had accomplished them, he says, Lie again on your right side, you'll bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I appointed you a day for a year. Okay. So the tribulation is seven years, or you could say the seven days of the Jewish wedding. How do you want to make it to the wedding supper? Not just the wedding. I want to make it, I want to make it to the wedding supper, but I also want to make it to the wedding. Well, guess what? Everyone is invited to the supper of the great God. All right. Revelation 19.9, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And look at the other side. A loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. The choice is, which supper do you want to be at? You can make a choice. You can be at the supper of the Lamb or the supper of the vultures. It's your choice. And I think one of the, the big problems that Christians have not being on God's calendar is they think, how many of you know God declared the end from the beginning? Well, they think linearly, okay, you got the beginning and the end is so far away. No, 
Everything is circular and the beginning and the end are connected. He can tell you the end from the beginning because they're next to each other. No, they're not miles away. And we're about to end Deuteronomy and circle back to Genesis and it's connected. Life is cyclical. It's not linear. And so all of our patterns gets mixed up. Uh, so with that said, let's stand. <laughs>